In a world where God is dying, four heathens come to deliver the final nails in the coffin. From the depths of hell, Satan sends four puppets of the imperialist West and the Zionist Jews against God, Islam, and tiny kittens to bring you their propaganda and conspire for a new world order. This is Secular Jihadists from the Middle East. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our first Ask Us Anything live uh, live stream podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Ali today to do the introductions for us as Faisal is otherwise occupied. Faisal is otherwise occupied, but he will be back. Um, he he did, uh, there's a little bit of, uh, he, he didn't leave early or anything like that. This is not premature evacuation. I had to say that. I had to. I'm sorry. I know this is terrible. <laughs> premature evacuation. But anyway, he, he will be back. Um, in the meantime, um, you guys know, if, if you're here for the Ask Us Anything, you know, you know the great Yaz, Yasmin Muhammad. You know, um, I'm not going to say you're the author of The God Delusion or part of Hamas because <laughs> that, I think, for the last four episodes, Fessel's run that down. Um, <laughs> Armin Navabi, uh, the founder of Atheist Republic, um, the group that all of the Islamists, Islamists, are we still using that Islamists? Uh, okay, anyway, yeah, yeah, whatever. Muslims. <clears throat> keep on trying to shut trying to shut down my name is Ali Rizvi and Faisal Saeed Al Mutar is going to be back and uh yeah welcome to this this is our first ask us anything so we're excited about it uh to hear from you guys and answer your questions uh but uh, before we start i wanted to um just it's been a very eventful uh week last week or two uh Armin was here in Toronto Armin and i uh, did an event at the University of Toronto with a great, great group, students group at the University of Toronto called uh, Students in Support of Free Speech. So if you guys are listening to this, shout out to you. Yeah, you're fantastic. Anybody who's at U of T or at York or any of the uh, um, Canadian universities should look up this group and join them. They're they're really doing work that is very relevant to what we're going through right now. Our event was called Muslims, young Muslims leaving Islam, the importance of free speech for apostates. And it was very successful. We had a great audience, really animated discussion. And um, this all happened despite the fact that it was a fast opening time and, and the Muslim groups were offering free food for everybody. But people still came, many people still came and they listened to us and got involved. There's a full video of the discussion that will be out um, shortly. Uh, and then the second thing uh, that I did, and Armin was uh, also there for, uh, was the Imagine No Religion Conference, Imagine Seven. And this was this happened also in Toronto um, over the weekend. And I was a speaker. I went right before Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins was a speaker. Lawrence Krauss was a speaker. Seth Andrews was there. He was awesome. He was hilarious. Um, uh, Matt Dillahunty was there, Kelly Carlin, the daughter of George Carlin, uh, she was there. And uh, did I mention Lawrence Krauss? I did. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I'm probably missing, I miss Jerry Coyne. Jerry Coyne was also there. So it was just a fantastic group of speakers, an excellent uh, weekend. Uh, we got to talk, Arm and I, and I were uh, sitting at the VIP table with obviously the speaker's table with Richard Dawkins the entire time. Armin gave him his book and Richard Dawkins asked Armin, he's like, can you sign your book for me? And Armin, the smile on Armin's face was just irreplaceable. <laughs> it was just really, really memorable. Um, I, I did uh, a talk that's very, very important to me at the event. I, I It seemed to be well received. Um, there was a good Q&A session afterwards and, and we're going to have video of all of those talks from Imagine um, the website is imaginenoreligion.ca. All those talks are, are going to be up on video for everybody to watch um, very soon as well. So those are the two events. The third thing is Fessel has an amazing announcement, right, of a project that he's been involved with that gained a lot of ground over the last week as well. And I am going to leave that as a cliffhanger for you guys to, so, so he can talk about it at the end. 
of the podcast. So stick around. And that's pretty much it. Let's uh, get going with Ask Us Anything. So Adi, somebody asked a question. I think that they're referring to something that you had said. They Mm -hmm. said, are they really that great? Their next event features Ezra Levant and Doug Ford. Is that Imagine No Religion they're um, referring yeah, to? Yeah, Imagine No Religion. They have another event coming up, and that has uh, Ben Shapiro and Ezra Levant and, and some of the other people. And and yes, the, the idea of free speech is to have people like Armin and I on, to have people who are from the liberal persuasion on, and also to have people of opposing views. I mean, we're living in a world where uh, there is a huge populist wave happening. Donald Trump is president. Um, you know, you've got Brexit, uh, you've got the rise of uh, a lot of uh, far-right nationalist parties and populist parties. So uh, that uh, dialogue is important. It's important to know what everybody's thinking. I don't agree uh, a whole lot with Ezra Levant. I don't agree a whole lot with uh, Ben Shapiro on many things. But um, uh, these are people who are actually going to campuses and being shut down. And I don't agree with that either. I think they should be able to speak so students in support of free speech is students in support of free speech, not liberal free speech, not conservative free speech, just free speech. And um, we, I don't think we should have any qualifiers on that because that's a slippery slope that, as you know, affects ex-Muslims probably more than anybody else. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Actually, that brings us to one of the questions that we have on Twitter. Uh, it's mm-hmm. from Gareth Johnson. So it's kind of related to free speech. He asks... How far should governments go to fight Islamism in their countries? Police speech that promotes it or only focus on terrorism? So do one of you guys want to tackle that one? How far should governments go to fight Islamism? Should they police the speech that promotes it or only focus on terrorism? Um, Armin, do you have to, anything to say? I mean, I got, uh, I well, have I, some I just, general I just thoughts, think but... I, I think government should focus on what government does and just provide security for all of us. I don't. Th- I think that's our job to come in and like. I think this is the role that activists like us or other ex-Muslim groups or other free speech people or anybody like. This is not. A, I don't think this is a role for government. That's where we step in and try to challenge people's ideas. Are we talking about terrorism or about Islam in general? What's the question is specifically? It's both. About- yeah. So they're asking like, how far should the governments go to fight? Like basically the growth of, of I don't think I think government should stay out of promoting one idea over another. I think that's for us and other individuals. So to they should the only ideas. get involved when it turns into terrorism. Right. I think they should I think they should get involved in providing security for their citizens. That's the government role. Mm-hmm. That's what the government is there for. So when they say get involved, because I I'm just gonna give you my opinion. I don't think we should police the speech that promotes it, but I do think that we should be keeping an eye on those places like so um harris uh from quilliam we're not actually it wasn't harris it was somebody else from quilliam but harris is the one that tweeted about it osama. was actually attacked it was osama that's right osama yeah thank Hassan, you dr osama Hassan. yeah, yeah was, was actually um like very aggressively attacked by one of the men who later turned out to be one of the london bridge uh murderers Huram uh, Shazad but the but there guy. you go with all the details yeah <laughs> um and they had gone to the police and actually it turns out that the imam of that mosque had also gone to the police for for one of the other guys so the the authorities were aware but they just didn't do enough about it they didn't pay enough attention and and this is a story that we've heard time and time again and it may have something to do with the fact that they're probably getting gajillions of people contacting them every single day saying this happened and this happened and this happened. But if they have people in the mosques or in the schools or um, just sort of paying attention and keeping an eye on what's going on, not necessarily policing, but just monitoring. Well, no, I mean, I sound like I want a big brother the place, but you know what I mean, right? Faisal is back for everybody. Hello, everyone. Sorry, but Ar- for, Armin, uh, Armin, go ahead and say what you were going to say. As a person of color, I would like to know the question. Okay, the question is, okay, you ask, you say the question. So the question is, how far should governments go to control the Islam, the growth of Islamism in a country? Should they police the speech that that helps promote it 
or, or stuff like that? Or should they only get involved when it becomes terrorism? I have the final solution to this. So go ahead, Armin. <laughs> okay, no, but, but yes, all the things that you mentioned is, 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 I think, probably is the right thing to do. I mean, I don't think those are promotion of any idea over another. Like, basically, part of providing security is finding ways to identify who might be a risk or not. And listening to these people and what they say might be part of the solution of understanding who's a risk or not. But I don't think the government, I think, I think that's obviously part of providing security. But the part that I wouldn't suggest is that the government coming in and be like, hey, people, maybe you should believe in this and not believe in that. No, no, That's no, something no. that I don't think the government should promote any ideology over another. That's for the citizens to try to challenge idea each other whether what which ideas are better. But obviously, if you could, if, if, if security analysts could demonstrate that people with these that say these things are a higher threat and we should pay attention, attention to them, that's not a promotion of idea. That's just you know, common sense that these are people, mm -hmm. you know, so, we have limited resources, so we have to make sure we are using the limited resources we have on, on you know, and on, on the people that matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can okay, I, Faisal, no, go, Faisal ahead. go ahead. So, I mean, uh, the government has been, in general, their moral arbitrary in choosing sides. So when the government is uh, allowing same-sex marriage, they are picking a side. And they are picking the side mm -hmm. of the liberal argument of same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, in general, government has been involved in moral and issues and extremism issues. The, the first way I think the government should deal with this is, first of all, hire better consultants to advise you what is the threat in the first place. So when you have the U.S. government and the Canadian government and the U.K. government in some cases listening to the advice of CARE and ISNA and other Muslim organizations that the problem with the reason why we have terrorism is because Macy's are not giving enough discounts to Muslims and we should uh, <laughs> sell baklava with $2 instead of, of $3. The moment they, they, I mean, one of the articles that was written after the Manchester attack from a guy who I believe was an advisor to President Obama, and he said the reason the Manchester attack happened is because of lack of jobs that Muslim community has and lack of integration. So I think number one for the government to do is to hire better consultants, hire, uh, I mean, I think with the UK government, they recently hired Majid or previously hired Majid, I, but uh, the Quilliam Foundation has been kind of giving advice. So I can make an objective. Yeah, the, uh, Quilliam actually advised uh, uh, David Cameron as well. Uh, the mm -hmm. uh, David yeah. Cameron's speech on Islamism was actually, he consulted with Majid on, on that. that. Yeah, yeah, that's correct, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. So. I think for number one government should do is hire better consultants, hire people who are, have more familiarity with why the prob what the problem is. And yes, I think the government should choose a side. I think that especially when it comes to foreign policy, we, we ha somebody also can make a foreign objective, sort of objective statement that selling weapons to Saudi Arabia, uh, allowing Saudi Arabia to build madrasas in Pakistan and Bangladesh, in, in some areas around the Muslim world are contributor to extremism and contributor to the rise of ISIS and others like them. So yes, I think the government should be involved on a mm -hmm. much higher level than they are right now and really be on the good side of history and choose the good guys of the bad guys. And one of the, can I make one simple statement before? It was like one of okay. the main arguments that well, What if made the ex-Muslims are the bad guys who are Islamophobes and you know the uh, the the Muslims who are trying to just live peaceful lives are the good guys. Like I, I I guess one of the questions I have, like when you gave the example of same sex marriage, isn't that rather than picking a side, isn't that just the government getting out of the way? It's like okay, kind why of. can't like what it's doing is it's actually allowing what what it did was it actually took a side when it didn't allow same sex marriage, but now it's saying okay, civil rights for everybody, fine, yeah, we're gonna or, allow everybody. I mean, someone can make the argument about abortion that government is picking a side, right? When you say when the government is pro-choice, that, that means that they're picking a side. But I just want to make one, make one point that I think, because mm. I've, I've been reading a lot of foreign policy articles over the past week since the Manchester attack happened. And, and one of the arguments being made that, that, like the, that the United States should maintain some alliances with some, to some extent, extreme Muslim countries to fight against Iran, for example. Because mm -hmm. like, we have to maintain the Saudi relationship alliance, the Qatar alliance, et cetera. 
even though now with Qatar is kind of shady, but with with Saudi Arabia and others because of Iran. And they always cite that we need, like just like the United States said with the Soviet Union against... Yeah, the enemy Nazi, of my enemy is my friend. Yeah, the Nazi Germany. But I, I think that, I mean, the the Muslim threat, let's call it the Islamic threat. It worked threat out in well in regard. Afghanistan, didn't it? In the yes. 80s. Mm, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, for, I mean, the Soviet Union was much more far powerful than all of the Muslim countries combined. Okay, so it made it but it may have sense over that over the time within like siding against Nazi Germany or siding sorry siding against Nazi Germany and siding against the Soviet we're, Union. We're going off topic. Yeah, but like, <laughs> so we should not uh, we should not side. I mean, we should not side with quote unquote moderate jihadists to fight against radical jihadists because mm -hmm. I think so that we should. We should defeat them all together. Can I can I say one last thing on this? Uh, yes. Okay, I was gonna uh, go ahead. Oh no no sorry, what were you we gonna say? Well, I was gonna ask you a question that maybe will relate to what you're about to say too. Is somebody ahead. was saying, is this discussion related to Theresa May raising the possibility of restricting civil liberties to combat extremism? I, so I, I guess was it's kind of related. Up. Yeah, yeah, I was going to bring that up. So she actually came out and she said that, and I understand why she said it. I get it. I know everyone's going to, but don't you understand why she said it? I know why she said it. She said, that, so here's what she said. She said that, uh, yes, I will. If our human rights laws get in the way of of uh, fighting extremism and Islamism, uh, then we will change our human rights laws so we can we can fight them. And to me, here's here's a problem. And I'm going to start with something I think I may have talked about before is Yuval Noah Harari, the Israeli professor who I really like, who is the author of Sapiens. And he described terrorism as not the bull in the China shop that goes and destroys all the China, but as the little fly buzzing in the ear of the bull that causes mm -hmm. it to go crazy. So the bull goes and destroys the China shop. And, and this is how terrorism works. And this is something, this is what I talked about at Imagine uh, as well. When you have the left chipping away at free speech in response to Islamic lunacy, and then you have the right um, compromising human rights because of Islamic lunacy, what work is there left for ISIS to do? I mean, terrorism is not just about bombs and bodies, right? Terrorism is about creating fear and that fear causes us to eat up, cannibalize, and eat away at our own most fundamental values, like human rights, like free speech. The moment we start doing that, we are not fighting terrorism anymore. We are victims of terrorism. All right. Does that make sense? It does make sense. But I, I, I don't, I didn't hear, maybe it's just me, but when she said that, I thought she was referring to religious freedom. Or no, deportation uh, laws. I think she was talking more about the deportation, deportation laws, laws in prison regard. and things like that. Or maybe uh, that too. That's yeah. also, yeah. I, I don't that, think she was as extreme as... She can, well, she actually, it, if she had said the same thing she said, she's like, this is what we're going to do. This is where she we're going to She did say human down. rights, which is pretty extreme. Yeah, if, but, she, if she had did not said, if she'd said everything she said, but not said that um, if, you know, our, you will change our human rights laws if we need to. Mm -hmm. That is a devastating thing. Like words matter. You know, here's yeah. the thing. Like, yeah. you know, people talk about policies versus rhetoric right. and they say policies matter. Rhetoric doesn't matter. That's not true. Like I have a dream by Martin Luther King. All we have to fear is fear itself. These, these are, this rhetoric is immortal. That actually shapes the values of a society. Policies come and go, right? But when you have the prime minister of the UK, saying that, okay, yeah, we'll change our human rights laws just so we can fight this stuff. That is exactly what ISIS wants you to do. And, you know, to talk about specific policies if you want to, but don't frame it in the way um, that would just play right into the hands of all the people who, you know, what, what they, what they want to um, say, right? Should we, uh, should we move on? Or Faisal, did you want to add a, a final point before we continue to the next question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that it's it's very uh, i mean i understand that civil liberties are extremely important and it's one of the things that we i mean i, I mean one of the questions of the 21st century is how can you balance freedom and security and how can you balance privacy and security but unfortunately some measures are needed to to create security and have to sacrifice some civil liberties i mean um mm -hmm. uh, and and that's the things that we have to go through every day i mean going through the airport and getting your back checked and 
and your leg checked that you have to take off your shoes. Imagine if there was no such a thing in which like someone with a bomb can go to the gate of the plane without anyone yeah, stopping the, the, them. You can say specific policy proposals, but when you frame it as, you know, we have human to, rights. Is pretty yeah. When you say those words, I mean, that that's actually really, really damaging. That's a terrible way to frame it. Uh, so for me, I, like, I, but sometimes I a, these terms, like, like, for example, like what, like human rights law may mean different, something else than what actual human rights are, you know, like when, when, uh, uh, Bill O'Reilly well, says we're getting war into on the Christmas. Islamophobia we're argument. getting, we're yeah. getting, yeah, we're getting but, into the weeds. Uh, it, it probably is an umbrella term, and hopefully, she did mean something like deportation laws or religious freedoms or stuff like that. Who and, knows? In, in which case, I would be totally with it. But mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, uh, I guess, yeah, words matter. Yeah, words matter, and hopefully. Uh, I mean, like, Hopefully look at Islamophobia, just the word said. Islamophobia. People are like, well, the word doesn't mm -hmm. matter, but it does. I mean, semantics, they do matter, right, when it comes to these things. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's go on to the next question. So you know Joshua what else Davis matters? Black huh? lives matter. Black lives matter. <laughs> Size matters. All, all words matter. <laughs> <laughs> Joshua Davis wants to know, uh, how does it feel to be, to truly be supported by the Zionist Jews? <laughs> so we have some Zionist Jews podcasts or uh, patrons. And they want to know how it feels. He's a great sound sound engineer. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm we not love sure the Zionist, Zionist Jew. He's truly very supportive. Especially Gal Gadot. She's my favorite Zionist Jew. Huh? And the next question, Wonder Woman. How oh. dare you not know who she oh, is? Oh, <laughs> she's a Zionist Jew. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So well. somebody, one of the questions was, if there was a movie about Yasmin's life, who would she want to play her? I would love for Gal Gadot to play me. <laughs> Because that's, that's shit disturber. Because <laughs> uh -huh. wow. her and I have similar body types, so <laughs> I love. Uh, it would yeah. just make sense. <laughs> I, I gotta say the IDF. Um, uh, don't, I, okay, I'm gonna sound totally sexist, but the IDF women. Uh, yeah, they're. Uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get into this. It's gonna get too. Okay, let's. You know what? Let's expand that question and ask all of us. So, Avi, if they made a movie about your life and Armin about your life and Faisal about your life, who would you like to play you? Oh, wow, that's I've never thought of that. I mean, I I I think Abu Bakr al Baghdadi would be good. <laughs> no, I should have known. Uh -huh. no. <laughs> I should have expected that response. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I uh, I I like him to be, yeah. I don't know, to be honest. I actually have no idea. I went I went Faisal to play me. Can I get No, Faisal? go fuck yourself. Oh. I guess no. 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 You can't afford him. You can't have Iraqis playing in Iraq. I cannot fake a Persian. I'm not Persian, okay? I'm not Persian. He's we not have Persian. to get you We have to get you a real Persian from Beverly Hills or something. Guys, I've, can we stop ganging up on the Iranian guy? No, it's like the entire <laughs> the entire Sunni block in the Middle East is, and they've even combined with Israel now and Trump to like. Get oh yeah, that's right. We should be just, careful. Just let, leave the guy alone. <laughs> oh, Poor Ali, leave, would leave you want Brittany, to play you? Leave a Britney alone. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, how man, about uh, I want to how about me? Ayatollah of Sanjani to play you, Armin? These people aren't even actors. He's dead. <laughs> oh yeah. Even better. <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I know some nice people who wear the hijab, but I feel like hijab and niqab symbolize support for Wahhabism and Iranian Shiaism. I associate these doctrines with strife and ethnic cleansing in the Middle East. Do you mind if I take that one? Sure. Uh, of course. Uh, so somebody sent me a message too, where they said, Yasmin, I feel really bad because whenever I see a woman in hijab, I assume that she is conservative and it makes me nervous. And I said, well, when you see a woman wearing like an Amish, you know, bonnet and an apron, do you also assume that she's conservative? And does it also make you feel guilty? Like there's nothing wrong with assuming that a woman that wears hijab or niqab is a conservative Muslim because she is. She's wearing that symbol because that's the message that she's telling you. That's what she's letting you know. Same thing when you walk through New Jersey and you see uh, Orthodox Jews wearing the hat and the little twirlies and the everything. It's in New that's York, what... sorry. It's in New York, not in New Jersey. I'm sure they're in New Jersey. When I saw them <laughs> for the first time in my life, I was in New Jersey. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. But okay, New York. You're right. The Orthodox are in New York. No, you're yeah, right. Yeah, they're, they're, they're in Brooklyn. We, oui, yes, too. You are correct. Just, just correcting you um, as an Arab. You're right. My uncle lived in New York, but we were visiting New Jersey at the time. Yeah. Um. Anyway, my point is that when you see people wearing conservative religious clothing and you assume that they're conservatively religious, there's nothing to feel guilty about. That's the bigotry of low expectations kicking in. That's you being trained to not treat, to see people with brown skin differently than you see everybody else. So when you see a Christian or when you see a Jewish person or when you see a Muslim person wearing that kind of clothing, it's totally natural for you to feel like these people are extremely conservative and they probably are, you know, devout in their faith. Mm-hmm. My cat's trying to get into this. Yes, room. can I ask you a question about this? Like mm-hmm. When you, I mean, if, if somebody decides to wear any kind of religious garb so overtly, right? Like like a, a hijab or a yarmulke or the, you know, what we're saying with the, the little curly things with the Orthodox Jews or whatever, uh, or yeah. a nice big cross. Well, big cross, you could be a hip hop. Yeah. Too, right. So, but w- when you have that, aren't they saying in a way? I mean, if I if I'm going around, if I'm a woman, I'm wearing the job. Am I not telling the world that okay, this is what I look like? I am announcing my religion to you, and this is what I want you to see me as. I Absolutely. want you to see me as. And that's why I hated it so much. That's exactly what it's I mean, doing. You're putting and the, putting the religious question. identity above your identity in that way, right? Putting, that's what you're putting forward. A hundred percent. And then not only, but then, and also you get treated that way too. So like that girl that was, that was trying to twerk in the street in London, I think it was in London. um, And she got attacked because they're saying, well, you're wearing hijab now. So you're like an ambassador for all Muslims that ever existed. And you have to, you know, you have to live with that. Uh You have to constantly be fulfilling that role and having that persona of the good Muslim girl because you've got the hijab on. It's a lot of pressure for the person that's wearing it. So I, I was thinking, so there's another thing. It's not that when you see somebody like that with a hijab on, I, I guess it could be, couldn't it be two things? I mean, one is like, if you see someone who's wearing it and they're wearing it out of choice, then you can assume pretty safely that they're at least religiously conservative. But if you, if they're not, and if they're twerking, you can, you can probably also assume that they're being forced to wear it. They've been told to wear it and they're going to get in trouble if they don't wear it. It kind of Maybe they don't like it. You're right. And that's where I was like, I was, Mm. it didn't matter that I was forced to wear it. The point is I was wearing it. And that is the message that I was giving the world. And it wasn't the message that I wanted to give the world, which is why I hated it. So when I would try to describe it to my friends, I was, I would say, because I was back in the emo days, you guys remember, I said, it's like, imagine if you're like an emo kid and you just wanted nothing more than to wear all black and you're being forced to wear a pink tutu and sparkles how uncomfortable you would feel that this is the clothing that's being forced on you. And this is the image that you're forced to give the world and people will treat you as such. Right. So when you, when people see you in a tutu and sparkles, they will treat you like a cutesy little girl when you want to be treated like an emo. So it's like, that's exactly how I felt. Um, just a minutiae. Yeah. Like how how should emo be treated? Like beat them up? <laughs> like just don't talk to them. Just leave them alone. This I is why we need. We need. Whenever I see the emo, that I think that's why we need more school bullying. Oh wow! Um, just to just to prevent. No, I'm kidding. But, I'm kidding, guys. Yeah, all the yeah. Pokemon lovers, all the emo people. <laughs> I love you guys. I don't think that uh, we need more bullying to uh, keep you down. I honestly don't. That was, that was just a joke. Bullying helps with socialization. I'm gonna be a devil's advocate for a bit. <laughs> Uh oh. For your statement, like uh, Yasmin, you said that like women who wear the hijab, they they like concert symbols for the Muslim community or something of that sort. But did they want to be viewed as symbols of Muslim community, or do they want to be viewed as individuals? Like so, the I woman guess it who was twerking. Depends on the woman. Every woman is different, right? Yeah. yeah. So the woman who was twerking or whatever, like she was. I don't think she was trying to represent Muslim women. She was just working, right? So but whether she di- wants to or not, that's what's going to happen. But twerk, isn't that twerk, the fault twerk, of the society? Twerk, twerk. Or yes, is it of the- course it is. <laughs> but what I'm saying is... Okay, so it's not so her was- fault that she's twerking or wearing a of hijab. Of course not. Oh, my God. I hope I didn't come off sounding like that's what I was saying at all. What I was saying was that because of the fact that she's wearing this hijab, she is expected to act a certain way by the by her Muslim ummah. 
Yeah. Right. So they yeah, put yeah. this on a girl at nine years old and they say, this is who you're going to be. So what I was doing was I was responding to Adi saying that the Islamic persona overrides the individual person that's inside of there. Mm, right. And yes, you, he was correct in saying that. And that was my example. My example was saying, so the, me and that girl and b- millions of other girls were put on a hijab at a very young age and our individual personalities were never even allowed to flourish or develop because we were already put in the garb and in the persona and that's what we had to fulfill. That's who we had to be, whether we liked it or not. Mm-hmm. I, have a, I have just one question. I mean, I know that the people have Q&A. Do you find there is anything positive about the hijab in terms of, I don't know, like status or respect or like, do, do, you, do you see anything positive about hijab? Or the candy now- stays fresh. <laughs> The only it's positive thing up. about it is if you're having a bad hair day, you don't have to worry about it. You just <laughs> put this thing my on mom, really. my mom used to wear a job inside when she had to go to work, and she's like, oh, "I don't have time. I just wanted to sleep in." Yeah. She just she exactly. loved, that's the one time she loved the job. She used to wear it. Otherwise, the rest of the time late. she didn't care. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, but who cares? On those days, I just put my hair in a bun or in a ponytail. I still wouldn't choose to wear a hijab ever again. Yeah. But in a Muslim country, wearing a hijab is not as a, much of a religious symbol as it is in a non-Muslim country. That's something that I probably should clarify. That's Please. a really good that, point. That's a very yeah. good point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so in a Muslim country, when you wear the hijab, it's more of a of a social expectation. And uh, in a non-Muslim country, it's not a social expectation. So it is more of a religious mm-hmm. symbol. I'm, I'm going to, because this is such an important topic and so relevant, I have to follow up with with a question that I got at Imagine at the, at the conference afterwards. And, and Jerry Coyne, actually, Jerry Coyne asked a different question. I think this is one question. It was from, it was from Melissa, your friend and my friend now too, um, who's awesome. Um, she said that uh, she I had a Melissa lot of- Chen. She's amazing. Yeah, Oh no! This is another Melissa. Sorry, oh, no, Melissa. I'm just kidding with you. Oh, my Melissa. Your Melissa, yeah. Oh, lots of Melissas. My Mel- <laughs> well, you know, we love we love Melissa Chen and we love Melissa K. I don't know how to pronounce her last name. I don't know either. A, a it's of, Ukrainian or something. Lots of it's consonants very difficult. in a row. Yeah, too many consonants. <laughs> it's in a, a lot of consonants. Yeah. Right now, so um, she said uh, that she had friends who she really loves who wear the hijab, and there has been genuine discrimination with you know women who wear hijab in the U.S. after Donald Trump and everything. And that's that's fair, and uh, she said that she does want to show solidarity with them, uh, but she doesn't. But, I, but so is wearing a hijab such a bad thing to show solidarity? And I gave her the example of what Alishba said. That's how said. we met, by the way, Ali, was her asking I, she, me that exact She mentioned question. that to me. Yeah. She said that in the Q&A. And uh, I, I, I ultimately, like I gave the example of what Alishba said, that yes, you know, it's like the Confederate flag. You know, you have the free expression uh, to, you know, sport one, but just don't forget what it traditionally meant and what that symbol represents. And mm-hmm. I also, that what I told her was, I, I said that you don't have to do something to show solidarity. If you want to show solidarity with FGM victims, you're not going to, you know, come on, right? So the, you can, I, I said that it's it's probably okay to just tell them that I want to show solidarity. I'll come out with you. I will fight for your rights, but I, I just, I'm opposed to the idea of the job. Like the, I, and I also said that, you know, just because I'm saying smoking is a filthy habit doesn't mean that I think all smokers are filthy people, right? So, so, um, what, what would you say? Did you so, me? what would you say, Yaz, to? <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't. I, I smoke. No, I, I totally agree with you. And in fact, I did send her Alishba's meme in our conversation. Uh-huh. But what do you, what do you think? What should you say to, what would you say to somebody who wanted to show solidarity but didn't want to wear the thing themselves? What should they say to the hijabi person to show, say that, okay, I support your choice, but nothing. Who walk? Do you walk up to people in turbans and say, "I support your choice for being a Sikh and wearing a turban"? Like, yeah, why are yeah, we treating yeah, Muslims so it, differently than everybody else? There you well, go. I would. Uh, That's I why would, I, I would support. I love That's it. fucking support, weird. You would I do would that support, in Surrey, yeah. Armin. You'd walk through Surrey and stop every Sikh guy well, and be like, I, "You know what? Me, if I, Congratulations." Okay. If, <laughs> if they were taking it off, if they were forcing them not to wear it, if they were making fun of them while but they I were wearing it. But I don't think that's it. what Ali's asking. Is that no, what no, you're but asking? Armin, let, let Armin, I want to hear what Armin has to say. No, Go I'm ahead. saying if people, 
So I agree. Yes, I actually agree with you here. I'm saying like there is a way to support these people without actually wearing the hijab, right? Like if somebody, if people were fighting, if people were like telling KKK people, right, that you, you're you not allowed to speak, right? And even though I completely disagree with people, these people, I would go and fight for their rights, right? But I would not wear KKK costumes in support in their solidarity of their support obviously right but i yeah. would go even though i completely disagree with these people i would like no this is a free speech society and these people have a right to speak and i will go fight for their right to speak right so no but i, I yes I, I think um i completely agree with you that it makes no sense for me to go put because i know what that kkk custom represents so i i don't feel like i have to go put it on what, to what show you why i support the people. Sikh turbans no, I mean, Sikh, no, I, mean, I think Sikh people have a very positive uh, view about their person. I don't, I mean, I haven't met many people, but every people seem to love them. So, but if it was the opposite and people were like going and pulling their turbans off, I would be, I w obviously I wouldn't for their, I wouldn't go put a f turban on my head to support them, but I would go and be like, well, this is not cool. Like I would mm. speak out against people doing that, right? Just okay. like, I, I mean, Atatürk and Reza Shah were against people's hijabs and they were not, you know, they were pulling people's hijabs off uh, during those times. But not we're not cool. doing that here. It's everybody's right to wear whatever they want here yeah. already. That I freedom agree. already exists. And if somebody tries to abuse somebody who's wearing any kind of religious clothing, there is already laws and places that will take care of mm. that situation. Yeah. So we're fighting for something where the battle has already been won. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's I mean, a good way I, mean, to I don't this. see... Like Mormons are being made fun of all the time. I don't see people wearing magic underwears in solidarity with the Mormons, you know? <laughs> well, yes. uh, that I might Thank do. Thank you, that might, yeah, I like, that's, I agree. that's a great I, place I to... I agree. Okay, no, no, yeah. but guys, but if they, if they do, the people... That, okay, yeah, obvious, but if if people with magic underwear were being attacked, well, you can't see the underwear, so I don't know how you could do that. <laughs> no, yeah. It's like, I mean, whatever whatever no, no, Mormons Mormon, we do... We agree with you. We're saying visible, exactly yeah. what you're saying. You're saying exactly yeah. what we're saying. We're on the same page. I think if we want to fight for people in hijab, we should fight for the people that are being forced to wear it. Exactly. Because that, that's the problem. I mean, There's no well, problem here. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes, that's actually that's a very good point. But um, you know, you can fight for both, but you have to fight more for the people that are being more discriminated against. Yeah, because like, there is no fight here, though. People already have the right like for, to. Yeah, like for example, if I say if I say that if I say that you need to fight for gay rights more in the Middle East, and we're not saying that you shouldn't fight for people gay rights in North America, but you, if you're doing fighting for gay rights, you should pay attention to where it's actually being discriminated. More. Like it, you know, you have to. You can't. You can't be a hypocrite and just focus. I don't know. No, I, I just, uh, of okay, course not. Of you're right. Can but we, I think can we start a hashtag or a campaign called "Take Off Your Hijab Day"? Yeah, they already a, have that. They already they have. That. It's called Noja Hijab. <laughs> yeah. So this is where women take off their hijab to show solidarity with the ones who are forced to wear it in places like Iran, Saudi Arabia, and yeah. pretty much everywhere now. But oh, no, no, no. it's anyway, not as popular. Yes, should we move on? Should we move on Let's to the next question? Yes. Okay. So uh, some people, page. some of our patrons are just commenting mm -hmm. on our conversation and they're talking about, um, okay, so I agree with Armin. I hate the hijab, but I defend the right of anyone to wear one. Most Mormons are white, so no one cares about people hating on Mormons. Uh, yes, that's about <laughs> somebody I, should... just, I just had this idea. Imagine if like with Jehovah's Witnesses, people will stop doing a blood transfusion. As a solidarity with the Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's or, the example or, I was given by people FGM. people cutting off their foreskin in solidarity <laughs> with yeah, the Jews and Muslims. Show solidarity <laughs> with victims of FGM. <laughs> Imagine it's like someone circumcising themselves. That's a, with, with that, with that actually, if you want to show solidarity with Muslims, so, if you want to show solidarity with Muslims, one. with most of them, in, especially in North America, take them somewhere quiet and then take them to a bar and buy them a beer while nobody, yes. nobody's looking. <laughs> with like a bacon they, garnish. They, they're going to appreciate that way more <laughs> than, you know, you just cutting off your foreskin or wearing a hijab for them. <laughs> anyway. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, so Joshua Davis is correcting us. He's our resident Zionist. He says they're both in NYC and in Jersey, you noobs. Okay. I think I did say they're both yeah, in oh my NYC. God, they're they're everywhere. The they're taking over. They're taking the over. <laughs> 
the yeah. Orthodox Jewish community. A book I read by Deborah Feldman was called Unorthodox, <laughs> where she talked about leaving the Orthodox community. And then, and I think she was in New York, like Faisal said. In yeah, uh, I mean, Brooklyn, some some so. live in Jersey, but like the major, I think I think the majority live in New York in terms of. Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Should they Lord. send? Yeah, yeah. More questions. Should they? But yeah, more questions. Oh, let's go. On, let's go on a different topic. Sure. Should they send arms to the Middle East, North Africa, so that they can fight them, and the West never sends boots on the ground? Oh, okay. Sorry. There's a couple questions in a in a, in order. I read them out of whack. Hold on one second. Uh, that sounds so good. So Faisal is saying that the West take on jihadists and radical Islam and fight them without involving the Middle East states. Should the West fight jihadists? all on their own? Should they do it with the MENA states? Should they not fight them at all? Should they send arms to MENA states so they can fight them and the West never send boots on the ground? Yeah, I think we've talked about this in previous episodes. And I, think, I, think I think that we've I said think we're that- not, I think, here's the thing though. I think we, we are, a lot of people think that there's a, a blanket solution to all these problems. I mean, I think it really yeah. depends on specific situation and specific time and who these alloys are and are how, how you know, and, and it's, it's very complicated, you know, and the, a lot of foreign policy and you need to be really not only you need to be an expert, but you need to also have access to information that most people don't have access to to be able to make any decision. And I think the solution to one case will be very different to the solution it is, to another. But case. I think on a general, Faisal made a good point a long time ago, and I've been repeating it ever since, which, because it just makes the most sense to me, is it, we're supporting the conservative Muslims. That's what we're doing right now. When we're supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, supporting the Linda Sarsours, we are a liberal, we are the West should be supporting the liberal people, the secular minded people in the Muslim world. And I think that if we did that instead of, supporting the conservatives over there, then we would be okay. And by that, we wouldn't be selling arms to Saudi Arabia because they're obviously conservatives. Mm -hmm. I, I think in the long term, it always, it's always come back to haunt us. That happened, I mean, uh, again, Afghanistan against the Soviets. Uh, Not happened. always. When the U.S. went and freed the French, they never came back and haunted us. Well, no, we're talking about MENA. Like yeah. Islam, Islam Not Middle States. East. And, so they're MENA different. is Middle East and North, of, North Africa, right? Aaron, mm -hmm. we're gonna forgive you because you because you just fucked up. Okay, like, I'm gonna ask about, another question. We're talking about <laughs> no. he didn't fuck up. No. No, yeah, we're, just, we're talking about the like, United States arming. <laughs> what is with the I Iraqi? I think it's the Iraqi Iran thing. I love how it's Iraqi Iran. I just like messing with him. Like we're, we're talking about funding militias or states in the Muslim no. world, not yeah, France in the World War II scenario. Yeah, but but again, like I'm saying, at the time at the time that the United States funded the Mujahideen, right now we can at that time the Islamic world wasn't so like so anti-US, right? And right now we can sit back and say like, whoa, that was such a bad idea. Look what happened, right? Well, you, it's so easy to say it now, uh, so many years after when you see the results. Uh, at this at the time, it seemed like no, no, no. A pretty I, good I was going to give that as a first example, but every know, single but time I'm, it's happened, I'm, if you take that from I'm then just, and then you look at arming moderates in Syria now and all of this stuff, it's it's I, I know, but you're boxed to... in, like you're boxed in, like you see, like we're okay, going you into see... the weeds, you guys. Let's leave right. it. Yeah, Sorry. Let, let me let me just so, make some comments. Uh, let me just make okay. some comments. Um, I mean, the, there are some short policy solutions and long term solutions. Okay, when you are dealing with short term solutions, you have to look at what the region has at the moment and what it has to offer versus long-term solutions. As as I mean, there are some states right now that are more allied to Western interests than others. For example, the Kingdom of Jordan, the King of Jordan seem to be more allied to the United States than let's say uh, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra, okay? So someone like the King of Jordan, the King of Morocco, uh, even Sisi to some extent, even though he, he has been shifty on some issues and been uh, doing lots of attacks on human rights activists and others. The Kurds in northern Iraq who are also f on the forefront on fighting ISIS. That I mean, there are. So there are people over there that we could be supporting that aren't Wahhabis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, so I just I think... have the way that I think about it is if Saudi Arabia, if the monarchy of Saudi Arabia collapsed and the people took over, and the monarchy in Iran collapsed and the people took over, which set of people would be more pro American? Iran, 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 obviously. Iran, definitely. Right. So when you're thinking about long-term investments, 
that actually plays a much bigger role than you know what the what the monarchy is, especially with all of these dictators but, that have but been think brought about down. it when when iran when iran fell to begin with it, the people at that time were also pro west pro western values and look what happened right it it, it did, but it didn't like when the when the shah of iran came back, i mean you wouldn't have had that revolution the shah was very very pro western he was actually he loved know, the us I know, but I'm just saying, like sometimes the people, so people support for the West, like politics. Sometimes it works a little bit independently from what people want. Fair. Like, That's when you fair. create a vac, when you create a vacuum in power, it's really hard to tell what's going to fill it up. Especially in those countries. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, and most likely it's going to be the Islamists. Mm. Let's move on. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is a question from Twitter from somebody named Johnny Buck, and Johnny Buck asks. Isn't it's Johnny a, Buck one of the the people who was identified in the London London? No, ter- that's oh, that was, hope not. that was oh, okay. That was Butt. Okay, that was oh butt. yes, okay, that mind. was Butt. Certainly no, this mind. guy's a uh, Buck. Yeah. Okay, he's there you a go. young Buck. Hey, just, sorry, Johnny Buck. Uh, I to spag that Butt. I, I didn't mean to demonize you. <laughs> or or Johnny Buck. I'm sorry, Johnny um, Buck. Okay, so are some Muslims at fault for not integrating in the West? This is long because it's not 140 characters. He screenshot it, so bear with me for a sec. Are some Muslims at fault for not integrating in the West? And is there scriptural basis for not integrating? Example, the verse, uh, chapter three, verse 28, let not the disbelievers take, sorry, let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoever does so hath no connection with Allah unless it be that ye but guard yourself yourselves against them, taking it as it were security. I know Yasmin Shazia Hobbs talked about being told growing up not to have non-Muslim friends. How does this affect the Western view that it's usually Westerners who are racist and refuse to integrate? I just want to add too that this is an Assam. Yes, you're correct with this verse, and there are many other verses to support this. Um, but I was just talking to a friend of mine who grew up in a conservative Christian household. She's an atheist now, but her mom was told not to even talk to the neighbors because the neighbors uh, were were not Christian. Uh-huh. So I think that, I mean, I'm not, I don't know this for sure, but judging from that one little anecdotal thing, I was really surprised because I was like, wow, I didn't realize, I thought it was all love thy neighbor. I didn't realize that, that, uh, that, that there were some Christians that actually... That Mm-hmm. She couldn't even, and this was her mom's. So this was a generation or two ago, but still. Um, but yeah, I, you're right. This is exactly how I grew up. I wasn't allowed to talk. I wasn't allowed to have friends that were non-Muslims. And if you do have friends that were non-Muslims, it was only because it was convenient. So like if you're working together, you have to be polite, but you don't actually like share secrets or be real friends. You're not allowed to be real friends. That's how I was raised. I mean, mm-hmm. to be fair, though, I mean, yes, you could correct me, but I, I, most Muslims that I've met throughout my life in Iran and outside of Iran, they don't know these verses. Like, they know how. Well, I they have know... to say something. I'm just going to interrupt you right there. You were living in a country where it's mostly all Muslims. So for you, it's not going to be as significant to be raised with the, the and maybe for, yeah. yeah. but in a country where you're being raised amongst enemies mm-hmm. all around mm-hmm. you, Mm. then your parents are going to drill that into your head. Well, at least they did for me and for everybody that went to Islamic school with me. Because that was the whole reason why fair, we built Islamic school. And to be fair, school. even where I, even in my, even in the country that I lived, I lived in a part that was less religious than most of the country. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can I, so, and that, can I that's share not one to say, story? That's not to say, sorry, I just had to clarify one thing. That, that's not to say that there aren't, I mean, a lot of people here, at least in Canada and, and, and the U.S., I mean, there there are many uh, Muslims here. Most of them, as far as I know, the people that we work with, the people at school, they're they're perfectly okay with being friends with people who are non-Muslims because you have to. You go to school with them, you go to work with them, you do everything. Um, and there are some who are taught at home not to be. But I that that racism thing is really important. I think that that's very true. A lot of Muslims. I I was actually recently at a at a it's dinner. Two way street. I think is the short answer. Go yeah, I, I know. I was I was I was at a dinner where a bunch of people were talking about. Um, what would happen if their daughter married a black guy, a bunch of Muslim people. And they were 
you know, they, clearly they had racist views of it. I mean, that that conversation, unfortunately, is too common in a whole bunch of different ethnic groups, right? Is so that, they didn't you know, even people, worry whether he was Muslim or non-Muslim. They were worried about whether he was black you know, whether he was or black not. Or not. And then I had to tell him, like, you know, the way that you guys are talking about black people, the way that you guys think, you do, you do realize that everybody else out there thinks this way about Muslims now. Mm. Right. And that day they were really taken aback. So there is a lot of racism, this whole idea that there's no racism against white people and so on. Uh, do you guys know, do you guys know Balal? The first, the yes. black? Balal okay, Habashi. So, yeah, exactly. So we, in our school, Balal is, was this uh, black guy that was a companion of Muhammad. But we were, and he was, he had a beautiful voice that he was said, like, say the Azan and apparently. He's the token was, black guy. Yeah, yeah. In but, a, but in the Islamic. no, but this he, is he what was we like were Akon. told. That, he could sing really that, well. This is this is what we were told in school. In school, that he was so pure and so good that when he goes to heaven, his skin will turn white. I know. I remember that. <laughs> I was taught that too. Yeah. Wow. Heaven bleach. Yeah, they also they also Heavenly have things in Iran. They also bleach. have this racism against Arabs too, right? So like yeah. the. And, then, and yeah. Arabs hate everybody. And was, but actually, I mean, I want to share. I want to share a story. As a... actually, sorry, I, I don't want to sound racist saying Arabs hate everybody. Arabs don't necessarily hate everybody, but Arabs do feel supreme over everybody. They feel like Allah chose their their language to write the Quran and for people to pray in. the The prophet of of Allah was chosen from Arabs, so they do believe that they are better than everybody else on the planet. But, okay, but go to, ahead. to their credit, Arabs are very warm people, and when they love someone, they really love it. So they're very, they're very energetic. But I want, just want to share one story, like, because I think it's really, I, to, to, to anyone's surprise, I did not have any big difficulty, any, any major difficulty integrating in America. Mm -hmm. I actually, it's actually pretty fucking simple to integrate in America. I mean, at least it's been my experience coming as a non-religious person to the United States. I find Americans in general to be very friendly people. The, I think that may go for all of us, actually. Uh, the, the yeah, I mean, I are. faced, uh, there was some racism. I mean, one of my fir first weeks of coming to America, there was a restaurant that refused to serve me burgers. He was like, is this guy from Iraq? We don't serve Iraqis over here. It was like this, like a guy with like a fucking Confederacy flag and... And well, when he says Iraq, yeah, that's, like, your, Iraq, that's your cue right are you, there. <laughs> are you from Iraq, bro? Are you an Arab? Are you an Arab? Yeah. So, <laughs> but overall, I mean, living, because I mostly live in big cities, right? I lived in a Houston first when I came to America. Then I moved to DC. You, you should have just moved... gone in and shouted Allahu Akbar on our Hibbal Moz, and he would have given you no. all really loud in the restaurant. <laughs> Everybody would run out, and you would have been his only customer. And I like, okay, I'll take all the burgers you want for free. <laughs> and Muslim all... privilege. Muslim privilege. I want all the pickles too. Uh, yeah, don't listen exactly. to him. You're gonna get shot. Don't listen to him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is bad advice. Uh, like kabir pickles. But, pickle. but yeah, it's like my people kabir say, pickle. like people. There are so many stories. And obviously, I don't want to make my story to be the the. But there are so many stories. People say like in America is too too difficult being a Middle yeah. Eastern and. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that because everybody first... loves to be a victim these days, and that's what makes the news, right? Nobody wants to hear. I wore mm -hmm. hijab for twenty years and niqab for another five, and I never experienced one ounce of racism. In fact, I experienced the opposite. People mm -hmm. tripped over themselves to make Exotic. sure that, yeah, and they also didn't want to come off as being racist. So they were all like, "Oh my God, we'll do anything you want. Just please don't." I, was I don't want to be accused of being. I was, I was once told I was being racist against somebody wearing niqab and burqa. And I'm like, how can I be? I don't even know what race she is. I can't see her. <laughs> like, can you tell me what fucking race she is before you ask her to tell me I'm being racist? <laughs> no, that's actually true. But yeah, I think, like I think it's like one bag. issue, one issue by face immigrants or refugees is language. I think that not long the language might help you like, and then you will, and when you don't know the language means you're going to go to people who speak your own language, right? That's so then true. That's you, true. When, when I used to cross the border to Buffalo, I used to live in Buffalo and I used to come back and forth. I once went with my mom and my mom has a Pakistani accent and they were a lot meaner to her than they were to me because I spoke better English. And the other thing is like, if you're a doctor, it was like, because I was a doctor, I'd always get let go. Even if someone was trying to be like, oh, you're a doctor. Okay. They'd let... So it's, it's a very, very different thing. If you speak the language fluently, like Fessel saying, or if you have a position that's respected or some sort of profession that's respected and they treat you completely differently. That's life. Can I it's can weird. I talk about the racism Persian people have for Arabs? 
first like this is so common like i have the the um if i remember our teachers having this made up hadith that muhammad claimed that his people are so bad that he doesn't consider himself an arab right oh and wow. Yeah, so, and I, I think, like, the, another thought by by one of our teachers was that the reason why Islam came to Arab is because, Arabs was because they were the worst people and they needed the most. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, Persians really... Y'all, Allah will only accept prayers in Arabic. But you know so. what's funny is that Iran has the Velayat al faqi system where you have a spiritual leader, but that yeah. spiritual leader has to be a Sayyid, which means he has to be a descendant of Muhammad, which means mm -hmm. he has to have Arab descendancy. So they have to be ruled by a guy who's got Arab um, descendancy, but my, they still are racist yeah, against I Arabs. Actually, pointed, actually, actually, most Iranians have a little bit of Arab in them. And I pointed that to my uncle, okay. and You're he welcome. told me... He told me that if he knew that he had any Arab in him, he would burn it off of his skin. That, that's how that's Faisal how picks up people, right? <laughs> Faisal goes up to Iranians and he's like, hey, do you want a little bit of my Arab in you? Like, the, I want to put most, some mo You know, no, this that's, is why that's, Faisal's that's, like, nah, it's not little. And, <laughs> he's going to be know, like Trump. My Look how big my hands are. So, this is, this my is, line. And this is why I have a hard time <laughs> associating with a lot of... You know, the, the anti-Islam movement in Iran is is also an anti-Arab thing, right? So they mm. see Islam as this Arab invasion of this great Persian empire that these barbarians came and did ruin our culture and everything. So they're not, they're, you know, I met a Saudi atheist um, in Vancouver and after a while he was like, hey, how come you haven't yet blamed me for ruining your country? Because every fucking Persian <laughs> Iranian... Yeah, but, but, but after that, I mean, that's not only a Persian issue i think that yeah. it's very common with 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 ex-muslims coming from ali's base of birth um lahore. that they have from lahore that's right from the islamic lahore. republic of lahore is that they the prostitute have, in french it's like no, many Muslims nationalistic in pakistanis huh this is something that unites this is the only thing that unites the liberals and the religious people in iran their hatred for arabs and this is why Saudi Arabia is such a more useful enemy for Iran. I'm getting triggered Iran. now. Let's move along. And okay, the so, hating on the Arabs. Okay. No, <laughs> I, I mean, this... Armin is so concerned about Arabs, hate, Persians, racism against Arabs, when he's being ganged up on by Arabs today yeah. so much. Uh, <laughs> that is that is a good heart, Armin. No, but, but, I, but I want to expand. I mean, it's not just an Arab, Al it's not just a Persian. Uh, I mean, I've noticed, I've noticed a lot from like ex-Muslim Pakistanis who have like very strong disdain for uh, for I think it's like they link Arab and Muslim together or Islam together to the way that mm -hmm. their disdain for Arabs is like it's true is is like uh, which is really interesting. I mean, I think it's like like and it's, it's unfair. It's collective blame is what yeah, it yeah. is. It's like non-Muslim Arabs have to deal with this, even though it's Ex exactly they, 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 they not, Jewish me. Arabs and Christian well, Arabs not, and not atheist Fata, Arabs. But that does not do that. Tariq Fatah loves Arabs of, and he uh, hates Hindus. I just want to say. Once, once in New York, I, I was I was stopping by like my old office. Anyway, like there was a guy came in who was like an Orthodox Jew, ultra Orthodox Jew. He told me, "What is Penn Station?" So Penn Station is on thirty fourth and eighth. At the Lamas over there, if you just walk six blocks, then he said, "You have an accent. Where are you from?" At the Lamas, I'm from Iraq. I was born in Babylon and then raised in Baghdad. Then he said, "You come up from a dirty land." He like pointed at me. You come up from a dirty land. And you are responsible for the Jewish exodus and the Jewish genocide. I'm like, calm the fuck down, man. I was born in 1991. I never committed <laughs> any genocide whatsoever. <laughs> like, I, I, and he was literally like shouting. He was like, you are responsible for the Jewish genocide. I'm like, I'm not responsible for anything, man. I scared, <laughs> I yeah. scared the fuck out of like, and like, I was it's like helping. all the white people that are, that are to blame for slavery today. Or yeah, the like, Jews I, who killed Christ. Right. Like, like I, he was asking me for help and he was like collectively blaming me for like yeah. Jewish genocide. Like what the fuck? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it's like, it's the same thing with like these people, like ex-Muslims who hate Arabs are like collectively yeah. punishing us for, I don't know what Saudi Arabia does to immigrants or yeah. like You're people right. come, like I'm not responsible for any of this shit. Well, all of it's us true. are and responsible. And not only that, I want to say that as Arabs, we are the minority too, because there's only like 20% of Muslims are Arabs. So most of them are South Asian or different ethnicities mm -hmm. anyway. But a lot of the ex-Muslims here speaking. in North America, 
yeah, most of them are not Arab Sumi. But what I mean to say is we're outnumbered in the ex-Muslim community. So when we get, but this does happen quite, you're right. People leave the religion, but they don't leave the tribe. And they do have mm. this disdain or anger towards all Arab people but that always didn't remember do anything this. to deserve that. The secular, is caliphate, she is, the this secular is why caliphate is an Arab. So, this is actually yeah. why Shiism took off because Iran didn't want to have like the Arab religion, so they they took Islam. We're like, we'll make our own Islam, like, and we, you know, so <laughs> they well, yeah, I, I love how they do that because South Asians love love to do that too. They like they love to say, oh, we're we're it's Mus we're Muslim and it's Islam and that's our culture, but it has nothing to do with Arabs. I'm like, mm, think again, because what <laughs> language do you pray in? <laughs> what yeah. kind of clothing are you wearing? Like, who who is the person that the, your prophet he's an arab like whether you like it or not it's an it's an arabic religion and when you when you when you take that on as your culture and who you are then you're you're trying to dress you're trying to take like the skin of arab people and put it on yourself and they do that a lot they're like my great great grandfather was oh, yeah. ba pakistani was, was arab love, yeah we, and they we say love. it like it's this point of pride to they, have they, like a drop of, Arab of They have a love-hate relationship with Arabs and they have a love-hate relationship with the U.S. Like they hate the U.S., but if they get a green card, they'll drop everything to go there. And if they, they hate the Arabs, but they will, any connection they can have, like naming their kids Arabic names, the Arabic Quran, Arabic religion, they will adopt that. Yes, and then they call me, and then they call me an Uncle Tom. You know, Iran, <laughs> Iranian Muslims having their prophet uh, being an Arab, which and the ra being racist against all Arabs is kind of like Nazis that Christian Nazis that worship a Jew. No, yeah, that's true. I said the Jew thing is so. That's speaking confusing. of, I think well, one thing that we all one genocide we're all responsible for is white genocide. I just want to leave it at there. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, moral of the story is everybody's racist towards everybody. Goes in all different directions. It's not just white people mm -hmm. that can be racist. So that's not yes. everybody. Yeah. I, but, I'm not racist. Well, not everybody is racist. No, not you specifically, but all people are all ethnicities are capable of being racist against all other ethnicities. It's not. It's not a monopoly on white people. It's don't have a monopoly on racism. Yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. bullshit. I'm against racism. Actually, it's I'm racist. Against racism it's and... racist to say that only white people can be racist. Totally. Yeah. Everybody else is capable. They can do it too. That's bigotry yeah. of low expectations. Like, what about what? Why are you like cramping <laughs> my potential, my racist potential? It's not like, <laughs> That's right. like don't don't stomp all over my racist potential. You're you're denigrating me. So actually, speaking of collective blame, Jan Skelton asks, "The terrorists are not true Muslims." This is a quote. How do we protect Muslims from collective blame when countering the no true Scotsman fallacy? So, I mean, I uh -huh. guess everybody has to deal with collective blame, right? No. Faisal and I were just... No, I mean, I think... I, How I can think we protect that, Muslims? That's what I think these, these, these distinctions that uh, Majid is trying to create, and I think that we can definitely push for, are helpful in that regard. I think that when we... Uh, kind of use terms like Islamism or Islamist versus Muslims, uh, Wahhabis versus so like creating like to show that Muslims belong into a spectrum, and not all of them subscribe necessarily to the uh, values that is advocated by uh, ISIS and Al Qaeda and others. I think it could definitely be helped to stop the collective blame and and I think we've drilled that into people's heads probably more than anything else. I I think people got that by now. That is not all Muslims. No, I mean I mean yes, uh, but that is not. Is, we all know it's not all not all Muslims, but we also not want to know who's responsible as well. So I think that after non-Muslims to say that the ideology of Islamism is really that we need to focus it's on a spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and focus on, on the spectrum will probably help the collective blame. So the next question is, uh, is there a scriptural basis for the idea that martyrdom during Ramadan earns extra rewards in paradise? Um, I'm sure that if I Googled it, I could find, or if you Googled it, you could find uh, the, the scriptural Quran, basis for it. In the Quran? Quran or Hadith? Uh, hadith, I'm pretty sure there is. Uh, in They're the probably, Quran, I don't think so. So this is just something that we sometimes we just know things because we were taught it, but we don't necessarily confirm, we can't yeah. quote for you exactly where it is. But if you Google it, I'm sure you could find it. Mm. But uh, most of the uh, 
You could also Google and find out how many different battles always happened in Ramadan. Yes, um, Armin. Sorry, um, I thought I thought everything was better in Ramadan. Like not just yeah, March, like anything that is good you do. That's during, true. Yeah, yeah. So it applies to everything, not just martyrdom. Every kind of good deed that you do in Ramadan can has more brownie points. Yeah. Okay. Is creating a new Islamic sect more practical than trying to reform the entire religion? Well, that's probably what's going to happen. It's going to create a new Islamic sect. And then just like Ahmadis and Sufis and everybody else, they're going to end up being killed because they're not following the major one. That's my, that's mm -hmm. my prediction. I I, I I don't know I don't, I don't I just don't think replacing bullshit for bullshit is a good idea. I know Armin uh, is pretty much in the same camp um, when yeah. it comes to this. So I, I I and as far as those distinctions that we go, I mean you know Majid has that the Islam Islamism and Wahhabism and all that stuff. I I think a much simpler distinction that is really easier for people to grasp is the one that I, I put forward in my book, which is just the idea that, you know, when you look at a Christian person, you don't assume that every Christian is going to support killing gay people the way it says in the Bible. So mm -hmm. they're not going to necessarily support Judeo-Christian values as they are in the scripture. So, th so that's something they understand. When you say Islam and Islamism, a lot of people come up to me like just people at work, maybe like I've heard this term, some, but isn't that the same? What's the difference? But because they, they can't relate. They can't think of Christianism, Christian, like what is this? So, but, but they can differentiate between Christianity and the average Christian. So if we talk about Islam, the religion and the average Muslim, that is a distinction, I think, that as you said, Yaz, that has been drilled in and people are aware of it now. And yeah, I think that it. we should uh, we, we totally should agree. bring that up. If you want to protect Muslims, just draw an analogy that they can understand. They're not going to understand Christianity and Christianism. Mm -hmm. They will understand Christian versus Christianity. Love it. Okay, so Faisal, I mean, Armin, this one is for you. I know you haven't been in Iran for a, like a decade, but this person is asking one of... Uh, somebody had said to them, I'm an Iranian living in Iran, and I have a dozen LGBT friends, and none of them have ever been executed for their sexual orientation. Stop spreading lies. Is it safe to be gay in Iran? Well, I mean, it's, it's safe to be gay and it's safe to be a, a atheist as long as you keep it to yourself. Okay, and, so. You know, <laughs> and you don't. <laughs> Not you really, don't go, then. Yeah, I and mean, you wear a condom. Okay, yeah. And you know what? Here's the thing. A lot of people in Iran live in their own social bubble and they have no idea what's happening around them. Like, uh, especially if you live in upper Tehran and you think like everybody is liberal and like your friends and yourself. And like when I was showing statistics that 85 percent of Iranian are religious to, to Iranians here in Canada, they, they wouldn't believe it because that, they said that's not my experience with Iran. You know, I, I myself, when I went to, from Tehran to Qom, I couldn't believe the the difference, right? I couldn't believe the the. I thought I was in another, another. I thought I was in another planet, right? But yeah, another. Here's an example I give. You know, when I would lived in Iran for a very, you know, we went to parties. We drank alcohol. My parents, both of them, drank alcohol. And every time we were stopped by a cop, and the cop, like, every any time that we were stopped by a cop, the cop would be like to my dad, like, I can smell alcohol on you. Like, what the fuck? And my dad would just gra grab grab his wallet and we will be on our way home. Nothing would happen. I thought that's what everybody does until mm -hmm. many years later where our maid's uh, brother was arrested and he, for drinking alcohol and he was he was lashed on his back 80 fr freaking times and I never knew that. I, I was like, I was 20, almost 20 years old and I couldn't believe that that happens in our country, right? Even though it does happen to a lot of people because people live in their own bubbles. Another thing, like I, I kind of knew some people say that you get arrested when you're with a girl, but I, I didn't believe it. I, I hang out with a lot of girls uh, when I was in Tehran. And then one time I was arrested. And I when I was arrested because I was in a, a car with a girl, I was like, really this fucking happens i couldn't believe that this happens because just you know people have different experiences right you know in iran there are a ton of atheists and they go in parties and they bash islam more than more than us like they 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 hate islam and everything is that's and there's but that's so in many Tehran, of them. right yeah that's but the thing is that get one of them to publish that shit right they would, you know, see, like this guy, Cena was on death row recently. Like, get one of them to publish a book about it or put, mention it in a newspaper. In Egypt, then, you wouldn't even say it out loud because even your own neighbor could tell on you. Yeah. Uh, actually, I got to say that. And 3,000 3, gay people being hanged, 
that's, you know, that's a lot, but it's also a very small fraction of all the gay people in Iran. You know, there's 3,000 gay people being hanged. That's actually statistics. So I'm getting it from human rights report, reports. So that happens. But 3,000 3, 000... people were hanged and you, like over the... Yeah, over over How over ma over many years, okay. But the thing is that no, but the numbers, the numbers are much higher. But, but the thing is that they will get they will be the the crime would that would be stated would be spreading corruption on Earth, right? Something like that. Uh, that would be the crime that would be reported. Uh, so the to to because that's the crime that is reported, the numbers are some could be off, right? Because there's no actually mention of homosexuality on this. So this is a very rough estimate, but this is based on human rights report. But even if it's 3,000 more or less, the thing is that the number of gay people that are there and don't get hanged is way, way more than this 3,000, right? And if you are, if you're not going out, if you're not, so here's another thing. If you are a liberal person living in Upper Tehran, you probably can get away with it more because if you're living in a religious, if you live in South of Tehran or you live in Qom and somebody finds out, they're going to talk about it and then they're going to, it's going to spread and somebody might show up at your door, right? But, you know, in Upper Tehran, when people are more accepting, nobody's going to fucking report you, right? So, and you feel like, what the hell are you talking about? I have so many, I have gay friends and this doesn't right, happen to right, people. Right, right, right. Yeah. So it all depends. So this guy probably lives in Upper Tehran or something. So he's thinking this is all just propaganda. Yeah. Uh, but yes, okay. you want to do one uh, last question and then I wanted to. Yeah, uh, I just want to, just to make one comment about this. It's like, I think a lot of it to do with, it has to do a lot with the class and how much money you have and how much, for example, like in Saudi Arabia, if you are connected to the royal family, you can get alcohol. Right, and you can run away with it, and you're not gonna be arrested. But if you are, let's say, poor, and you get alcohol, and then the moral police comes and kicks you, so there's a lot of class. Like in, I think in Pakistan, the same thing. If you have like connections to the royal, fa like ruling parties, and you can have house parties and stuff, and so so a lot of it is is much more complicated than just atheists being killed. And there's a lot of connections that when you have them, you might be able to save your life. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, let's do one last question. Then, uh, Fessel, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about, I, I teased it in the beginning when you were away, about your new project afterwards. And we can kind of close off on that. Great. So. Okay. So um, Lalo actually asked two good questions. I'm going to ask both of them, and then you guys can, can answer we skip whichever Lalo? one you want. Can we skip well, Lalo? Well, his, his are the best questions. I'm just kidding. Lalo, I love you, Lalo. <laughs> <laughs> so his first question was thoughts on Imam Tawhidi. So he's the uh, Imam from Australia, Imam of Peace. And then his second question is, should we as critics of Islam and atheists worry about bigotry against Muslims when the left is already obsessed with defending Muslims? Do they really need our help too? So yeah, I, so. to the second one, I, I, I think yes. I'm not going to say anything else. Um, I think that uh, the basically you have to stick for your values. You're not going for – it's not about Islam. It's not about Muslims. It's not about this. It's about um, civil rib liberties Human and calling rights. out bad yeah. ideas. Calling out bad ideas means that you challenge Islam and you challenge with all faith, but specifically Islam because it's a problem and uh, protection of civil liberties. If that's your values, then you should do that. And I'm not saying that we have to go out of our way to do it, but if it does come up, uh, we shouldn't say, okay, well, we don't need to, that's secondary. Right. Um, and we should be careful with our speech. Like you said earlier, that we're talking about the religion itself. We're not talking about yeah. 1.6 billion yeah, individuals. I don't have to be that careful with the speech, but I think it's very obvious. I think whenever you criticize Islam, the ideology, um, I just I, I think most of all four of us, at least, every time we do it, I don't think that anything that we've ever said can come across as being bigoted towards uh, people or Muslims uh, in any way. So I think we do that fairly well anyway. Um, and uh, the first thing about Imam Tahidi, I've been kind of reading about him. I don't know. There's like too many people like that coming up, like these guys who just look completely like, I, I think they should just come out of the closet and just be themselves. Sort That's, of like uh, Majid kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Majid actually is, at least he's, I feel like he's a little bit more honest about it, but yeah, 
I, I don't agree with the whole Islamism thing completely. And, you know, all, all, we've discussed that before. But, I mean, this is beyond just Majid. I mean, Majid says that he doesn't he doesn't put on the, the beard and the turban and everything that, you know, he, he doesn't present himself that way. He doesn't say that he speaks for all Muslims. He admits that he's not very religious. He knows, like, he, he, said, he said all that stuff. But I, I kind of feel like this is, is this, you have somebody who looks like a total, um, you know, uh, it just doesn't fit. I don't think it's convincing. I don't think that the, it's convincing to to put on that front and then um, just be yourself. That's, that's what I think. I, I feel no, like this. Person I like is him. Me... I think he's. I, I think he is. I, I like him too. I do. I do like him. I just feel like it's not believable. I don't think that from a PR point of view and from a uh, you know messaging point just, of view. I just I don't just think don't it's understand. convincing. It make, I just. I mean, I like the guy. He sent me a picture of himself with Khomeini, with Khomeini's son. But uh, <laughs> yeah, he did. But I, I just don't. I just want to talk to him and figure out, like, okay, you're telling me there's problems with the Quran, right? That's what he's saying, right? Yeah. Why are you and still then, in it? And then, and yeah, then, yeah, he, says that, he says that. He said that. And then, but like, they okay, all say that. But, no, no, all the no, no. Reformers but say that, that makes no sense. Like, okay, so do you believe the Quran is the direct word of God? Do you believe God makes mistakes? Like, how does like this? But how okay, is that the, different than any of the other the, reformers? Then, it, yeah, it well, isn't that much. That's it isn't. And they're like, okay, so you're a Muslim that's saying that God made they're a mistake. They're all the same. They just like, have different brands understand. of bullshit, but it's all bullit. Like, well, just like different like, flavors. Either, this is a either little you're too saying, fantastical you're saying, because of the, either you're the look, saying, right? Either you're saying this is not the word of God, which makes you a non-Muslim. Or you're saying God makes mistakes, which again makes you a non-Muslim. I don't understand it. Like, how could so you then, know? therefore, the reformers not, are all non-Muslims. But that's not the way. But that's not the way they interpret things. I mean, they say that that uh, that uh, uh, the Quran was written by men, not by Allah, and therefore that makes you not Muslim if you don't yeah, believe in the Quran. <laughs> but the, the, the reason I'm saying Ahmed, that the reason I'm saying it's so hard is... to believe, the reason I'm saying it's a little harder to believe uh, on that thing, and I'm sure he's a wonderful guy. And honestly, yeah. to be, I haven't heard all of his interviews and everything, and I, I will go and listen at some point. But the the difference is like like Majid and Nasra, they don't call themselves imams. You, you know what I mean? I think that's a significant difference. That's you know, to, it... to be to be fair, anybody 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 that is fighting for peace and free speech and secularism I, I, is I'm probably yeah. a, probably a nice guy, right? Yeah. And whether we agree with what they're saying or not doesn't mean that they're not good people, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is there is a very known like I would say known, but there is a well known Iraqi cleric called Ayad Jamaluddin, who also ran for elections, and he. Uh, like always stuck, stuck against, against political Islam and the need for secularism. And, and you also wear imama, which is what this, the, the, I mean, imam yeah. for peace is a Shia. So mm -hmm. the same can be said with Ayad Jamal I mean, I, I, I personally oh, wait, support. Shia? Yeah, okay, yeah, I yeah. take back everything I said. I, I love this guy. <laughs> He's uh, a great guy. <laughs> <We> love him. <laughs> um, I didn't so, know I mean, Shia. I am okay, for... Now. Me personally speaking, I mean, I, I think that this guy is encouraging discussion within Muslim communities about mm -hmm. what Islam is and what Islam should be and and how should we challenge things. Uh, I mean, who, who we is always Imam say Imam Fisa is doing that, or who, yeah. who is doing that? Yeah, Imam Fisa is doing that. Yeah. So I mean, we always say, I mean, not we, but like generally after every terrorist attack, people say, "Oh, where are the Muslims who condemn terrorism and stuff?" Right. I think that to see like Muslims and Imams like him and others. Condemning and then they're terrorism. like, "You're not a real Muslim." Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, but, but he's being called not real Muslims by us. So, so I think that we're being yeah, kind of hypocritical yeah. by saying no, yeah. that no, when no, a Muslim no, no. condemns terrorism, we say, "No, he's not a real Muslim." No, so yeah. we're sounding yeah. exactly yeah. Why are you like no, terrorism? No, yeah. no, 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 no. Let Make me clarify. Mind. Let me clarify. We, when we, if so, people condemning terrorism doesn't mean that they're saying that the Quran is, you know, first of all, okay, first of all, I think it's a good thing that he's saying it just because. I think he's not a Muslim. That's a compliment, by the way. Not a mm -hmm. right. So that's a compliment that he's not a Muslim. Okay. Come on. So yeah. just because just because I think he's not a Muslim doesn't mean that I don't think but that Armin, he's him. Armin, he's I have bringing a question. discussion. What is Imam Tawhidi saying that is different than any of the other reformers that you've heard? 
I agree. Well, that's what I'm, I'm saying. I, this He's is a criticism for a all of them, actually. No, you're right. You're, yes, is right. All of them, anybody that says that the Quran is fallible or the Quran is not the direct word of God, by definition, this is not this true, no true Christmas fallacy. This is because this is by definition not a Muslim. Okay. And that's not a, that's Why not do an you insult. Complain, that, that's, Let people be Muslim a, and do whatever they want. I'm not complaining. Like, I, I'm I not complaining. With you. I, this is, you know what, Armin? You're like those people that say just because you have a penis, you're not a woman. No, okay, no, no, first no, no. of all, I'm I not actually, complaining. I this is not a complaint. This, this, okay, I'm this kidding is, with you. I'm this kidding. is not a complaint. I like him speak, because like, just I like you said. You're complaining too much. No, I'm actually supportive of him bringing up no, these discussions. No, supportive because, of the, the calling him not Muslim? What kind of support is that's this? A co what? That's a compliment. Fuck, man. That's it's a, a fucking compliment. compliment. To you, but you wouldn't want to hear that. <laughs> this is not a compliment. You're telling the he guy wouldn't like some, hear that. when a guy identifies in a certain way and he's saying he's a Muslim, you don't get to tell him you're not a Muslim. This is not. He's an, he's what an atheist Muslim. I, 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 atheist okay, Muslim. I, he's an atheist Muslim. That's yeah, what he is. A, <laughs> yeah, he's a cultural Muslim atheist. But no, here's no, the I'm thing: kidding. you can't just yeah. identify as anything you want. And you know, I, 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 I identify as a Christian that doesn't believe in God. I could just say that, but you guys were like, "Well, you could identify that, but that's not part of the definition that's of Christianity." That's the world we live in today. If Rachel Dolezal wants to be black, Sean King wants to be black. People want, you know, that's it. You gotta I, let I just, people do what they want to do. I want to say one thing. The one thing that I disagree with Armin on. Right is is this last point? I think that with for the longest time in Judaism, the Torah was the word of God. It was given to Moses at the tabernacle in Mount Sinai. It was revealed to him just like the Quran was revealed to Muhammad. However, with time, now you have religious Jews who don't consider the Torah to be with the word of God. Religious okay. people. I don't they, know. They, I hold don't on, know what... hold on, Armin. Just let me finish. They consider it to be divinely inspired. I think if we can move in that direction, and if mm. you could redefine, that's. I don't think you Inshallah. can take individual scripture and change words and all that stuff. That kind of reform mm -hmm. we've talked about it. I think that's bullshit. However, if you can say that overall the Quran, okay, is divinely inspired. It's, it's not metaphors. the divine word of God. I think that can be a new definition of Islam. Yeah, and it on can that, be a new definition. Once you change the definition, I'll agree with you. But uh, you you still haven't changed the definition. The no, definition that's what we're of trying Muslim. to do. Trying that's what we're trying to, to do. He's trying. Well, so we, we want to, but you're efforts. getting in the way. You're getting in the way. You're not letting me change the fucking definition. <laughs> yeah. So you're telling him. <laughs> you know what? Him that Herman you represents move... ninety plus percent of Muslims. Exactly. These people that we're talking about are in the West. In the West, Majid can change it. Imam no, Tawhidi can no. change it. Asr and Amani can change it. Thank you. But you know what, no. you guys? We've all, no, 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 no. Oh, I've lived on, in there, Qatar there and I've lived in famous. Egypt and ain't no fucking way that's going to happen in our lifetime. I am sorry. No, that could is, happen maybe Islam in my Bahari. grandchildren's I lifetime. I disagree. I disagree. But it, no. You know why you disagree? Because South Asians are different. No. Pakistanis are different. No, no, no. Hold on. Let me talk. We Pakistanis are the ones really that say stuff like, like they really are different. They're the ones that look at the Quran and say, beat your wife. Mm, actually, that means lightly. Meanwhile, Arabs are like, fuck that. Allah didn't say lightly. He just said beat her. So you can beat her. There's no stipulation. No, South the, Asians are that, always trying to make Allah nicer than he really is. So, so They're that me, guy me, that Allah's in the bar and he's drunk and he's like, y'all motherfuckers need to die if you're not Muslim. Okay, okay, and let the me, Pakistanis let me, let me just, come along. Let me, let let me, me finish let me talking. No, no, yes, and then yes. the Pakistanis come along and they say, no, 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 no. <laughs> Don't listen to him. He's drunk right now. Just give him a minute. Actually, what he really means is blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's what the Pakistanis do. And that's maybe why you see things differently. No, but that's as somebody not what I'm saying. who's lived I, I, in the Arab world... Arabs um, don't do that. No, no, I Arabs I know, are I, like, no, 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 no. That's what he said. That's what he means. Yes, I agree. With, I actually wrote exactly what you're saying in my book. I said the only people who think that doesn't mean beat are the Pakistan, the South Asians, us South Asian yep. scholars. They're always so, trying to make a lot nicer so than again, he actually is. Again, let, let me just clarify and I'll make this really short. I think the people who try to reinterpret individual verses by using abrogation and all these exit, I don't think they stand a chance against the fundamentalists. And I completely agree. I don't think you can reform Islam that way scripturally. But I think if you take the entire scripture and you change it from divine word of God to divinely inspired or, you yeah. know, sort of like said by the prophet, but it's say, still Why? sacred, but Why? not totally. Why? Hold on, hold on. Arm, arm, hold on. If you can't convince an atheist, you're not going to no, convince No, just Muslims. a second. When you, if you can do that, I think that 
that is a way up that is much more practical because it has precedent the jews have done it and the christians have done it and it's worked okay well, ali, changing yeah. individual scripture doesn't work i read ali i read your book okay you're not pro I, i don't know what you're talking about because you're not promoting it you're promoting people keeping culture and throwing away belief that's what you're promoting in your I'm book promoting that you're too I, yeah, I so a whole bunch you're promoting of, you're promoting I, the ex I don't you're, remember you're the book. Okay, I wrote it a long I know, time ago. I know, I know. So why I was are drunk you? When I wrote it. Why are you stepping away from the I, the beautiful <laughs> thing in your book? Your your book is fucking great because no, you are selling. Armin, you are, I also put this in it. I did. What exactly what I'm telling Yaz? I also put that in it as a way, not as as a way of again, not reforming scripture, not reforming the ayats and changing the words and everything like the South Asians do. And Yaz is right about that, but changing. That but good, people okay, good luck with that. that. Good luck with that. But here's the thing: look at what's happening. Look at the reform movement, and look at how many people are just abandoning Islam altogether. This is happening. Yeah, right? like we how... don't. I mean, we, these two things can, can can go together. I mean, if there is right, if there is a right. Muslim, if there is an Imam Tawhidi, whatever his name is, is trying to 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 make Islam divinely inspired than to literal word of God. All power to him. You don't need to tell him totally. like you're yeah, like you're not a real Muslim. You're not like you don't need to step in his way. You don't need to, you don't you don't that's complain. Not against it, that's not in no, his way. Don't, don't get to smoke 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 that's what they're coming for. It. They spit in his face for I'm it. Welcoming him the right in the thing. ex Muslim community. That's no, don't welcome doing. him to anything. Let him be <laughs> just let him be himself. And you don't need to go because like I mean, we need I mean, I think that If he has imam, he has a whatever like clout within any Muslim community trying to change things. Good luck for him. I I, I don't see. I that just think really and I he just has think more like... clout in the Australian community than Majid in the Australian Muslim community than Majid has in the British Muslim community. Let's be honest. Okay. Because at least because of the fact that he's an imam and his okay. father was an imam and okay, his guys, grandfather and he has a lineage of people in his family that were uh shia scholars and shia imams any, so he is respected Lalo, any muslim, you're starting any muslim, sectarian wars again Lalo is any, starting muslim, sectarian any war muslim again. that takes this imam seriously was already somebody that wouldn't didn't want to hurt anybody and just looking Good. for excuses right this That's is not going this is these reform these people these moderate muslims are not moderate because they have a reform view of islam these moderate muslims are moderate because they're ignoring islam Right, moderates right. are like, moderate because of, moderates, moderates are moderate because of an abandonment of Islam, not because of a reform. But there of is Islam. a spectrum. No. There's, there's a spectrum. Islam. They're there's moving a along. There's a spectrum. There are people. Any, anyway, I, I right. know, I know Muslim. I know people who are very close to me in my family. After like getting, uh, they were more conservative and they were convinced otherwise by another kind of more liberal version of Islam, and they followed it. People change. It's like uh, Majid went from an Islamist to non-Islamist. There are people who were conservative became liberal. There are liberal Muslims who became conservative. Like there are so many power of persuasion and marketing and convincing that goes in these things. And maybe this reform version may be able to change some. If if somebody change if somebody changes the mind of some Muslims and telling them that the book is divinely inspired, then they're not going to take things more seriously or more literally. Then they're going to be less following the hadith and stuff. Let's let, let's like let these people do whatever they want, man. Like, rather than ra okay, so let's put it another way. Rather than uh, encouraging reinterpretation, we should be encouraging re uh, the rejection exactly. of infallibility. Yes. No yes. rejection of infallibility. Oh no! So that means you can keep the whole thing. Yeah, Armin wants ground, to like make reject the infallibility Wait, aspect. Why are we treating treating people like idiots? Though we're going to them and like, hey, this bullshit. A lot of like, them are idiots. A lot of them are. <laughs> they are. But if they're idiots, they're not gonna like. How? How? Trump why are you president? Yeah, go on. Armin, go we on. don't disagree with you, Armin. Okay. I think I we're all on the same page. Find this final solution. I'm just it's just like, that that's the problem. There isn't one solution. Right? There is. There's the solution is critical with... thinking skills, not selling bullshit. Correct. Not, yeah. I, I think you have to you push that. everything. We, we have to push you, everything yeah. and see whichever one works as long as we get rid of ISIS. Okay. End okay. of discussion. Okay. That's, that's, wanna... that's a good place to... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. I'm not going to well, cut you my, off. Well, what I have to say is going to sort of open another can of worms because it's kind of a question for Faisal because... I do want to talk about this Islam versus Islamism and Islamist versus Muslim thing. And I do agree with what Ali was saying and which was something that I've been saying too, which is that we got to get rid of all of this terminology that just confuses things and just talk about a conservative Muslim versus a moderate Muslim or a 
or a um, secular liberal or whatever terminology fits the individual because there's lots of different in different kinds of Muslims. It's a spectrum. Um, but my question about that was, um, if we are, oh my God, I think I, lo I lost my question. <laughs> Hold on. Shit. Uh -oh. It just left good. my head. A goat ate it. I mean, you do, do you want me, do you want like me the, to explain? Like the verses of al <laughs> Just wait, right? I, I started giving the background and then I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Okay. So if you're going to have, is, if you're going to talk about Islamism and you're going to talk about Muslims, then what you're saying is basically Muslims are the good people. No. And the Islamists, okay, hold on, let me just finish. Yeah. When Majid or when the general public talk about Muslims versus Islamists, what they're saying are Muslims are the nice ones that we love and they're our friends and they're our coworkers and our neighbors and whatever. And Islamists are the bad people like ISIS. So my problem with that distinction, it, it goes back to sort of what well, he, Armin he is saying right the now. Islamists versus jihadists. He also says Islamists do it through peaceful means and through dialogue and jihadists okay. do it through okay, violence. Good. So, so yeah. Okay, the, fine. Yeah. But yeah. still, even if it's even if a person isn't a jihadi, even if they're not an Islamist, even if they're just a a Muslim, still as a Muslim, there are still problems there. Yeah, I agree. I mean, can I can I explain my view quickly? Okay. Why I think these distinctions are necessary. I don't yes, think that I the distinctions, distinctions are not this... necessary. What I what I have a problem yeah. with is that people making the distinction like these are the bad ones and these are the good ones. No, I, I don't really see it this way. I see it that I mean Islamists are Muslim. Yes. Jihadists are Muslim. But not all Muslims are Islamists and not all Muslims are jihadists. Correct. So the the those who So why I don't mean, we just the, 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 Okay, the, go on. Yeah, so so the reason why I think it's very important is because just like, I mean, so there is conservative, I mean, conservative Muslims have, or conservative Islam has problems as well, right? So so they all have problems. So, but it's I think it's all about setting up policies is that what do you, so there are, there are conservative Muslims who, let's say, live in Western societies who say, okay, we don't like the law, but we have to respect it because it's the law of the land, okay? And there are Muslims who say, we want to overthrow the law of the land. We want to have Sharia law in the UK. Groups like Muhajirun, Hizb al Tahrir, the Muslim Brotherhood, all of this stuff. So there's a distinction between even conservative Muslims who are Islamist and conservative Muslims who are non Islamist. So when you are trying to set up policies, and not even on policies, but rather on, on, on kind of setting up priorities now, we deal with Islamism or these people who believe in Islamism. Then we tell people who believe in conservative. Okay, Islam. but Faisal, can I just ask you something? When you say these people believe in Islamism, I don't know what you're talking about because there's no such religion as Islamism. No, no, it's not. It's not it's different religion. Is is interpretation of Islam that is. Okay, Islamism. so Majid That's doesn't say I mean that if you read Radical, he talks about Islam as a separate thing as Islamism. Islam, yeah, is I mean, Islamism. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so I agree. I think that Islamism is a plausible interpretation of Islam. I don't think that they are distinct, but I don't think that every interpretation of Islam is Islamist in nature. So, for example, like Sufi Islam or kind of known Islamist Islam, this thing I think is so possible. So you're saying Sunni Islam followed. is Islamist, but... Not necessarily. I mean, there are some, there are some, but, but what I'm saying uh, is like, I, 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 make I, don't, I think it's impractical so I don't think to get the separate. average person to adopt huh? this stuff, to, to understand, for the average person out there, the average non-Muslim, someone who's not really, really involved in this stuff to understand, okay, there's Islam, then there's Islamism, then there's this. And I, I mean, I, I understand the distinctions. I, I get why they have value, but I just don't think that it's something that will resonate with, um, the public in general because i yeah, think it's too I agree. confusing i was too born complicated. and raised in this stuff my whole life and it even confused mm -hmm. i'm asking questions mm -hmm. yeah no that, that's why i think just islam versus muslims moderate muslims conservative muslims christian versus conservative christians all that that give them terms they recognize as we said before yeah you know, but it's... but in america in america there's also a term called the christian rights and it's been popularized in the new york times the Washington Post, all of all over the U.S. media, the term the Christian rights. It means the Christians who support Christian theocracy to come to America. I mean, just like the Islamism is the Muslim right or Islamism. I don't I mean, 
let's not use Islamism. I, I think those let's are say, great. Let's the say Muslim the Muslim right, rights. The Muslim are the right Muslim is there, a great. That's yeah, a yeah. Great so, term. I like so the Muslim it's more clear. Right. I don't really. I, I'm not really stuck on the term Islamism. I, I, I think the distinction is just being made that to show who is a theocrat and who is not a theocrat. That's kind of mm. the. So if we call it the Muslim right, I don't or, or Muslim theocrats, because I think yeah. So I, I don't really. I'm not. So, I, so yes, the Muslim right and the Muslim wrong. And uh, okay, okay. So let's wrap this wrap up now. Up. We're, and I want to, Fessel. Can you quickly, uh, because I know Armin has to leave very soon. So Fessel, can you quickly go through? I put a teaser in the beginning to, to saying that you're going to talk about your new project. Can you yes. announce your new project before so, we go? First, I am now officially the president of a new organization called Ideas Beyond Borders. Yay! Yay. Everybody, applies. hopefully, we are we Amazing are going to receive the funds to start. Like very soon, we're going to have multiple programs. The major program that we're going to start is called the Canvas Program, in which we uh, create a speakers bureau and we're going to create fellows in 10 different campuses in the first year, in which we make 30 to 50 events per year to talk about all the subjects we're talking about in this podcast, and create discussion around US campuses that are anti Islamist. Support the human rights, talk about the conversation about human rights and secularism and the questions that all of us are asking. What is Islamism? What is Islam? What are the distinction? Is there any distinction? Does reform have a, is there is reform work? Does reform does not work? We want to bring this conversation to a place like the campus in order for us to create this conversation as well as challenge the mainstream Muslim organizations who have confused people about all these things telling people that uh, the reason we have ISIS is lack, is lack of jobs and we need to create more jobs at Macy's. So we are trying so we're to- We're going to have clarify things. Can you so, talk about who you're collaborating with as well? So the, the program is in collabor collaboration with Ayan Hirsi Ali Foundation. Yes. And uh, hopefully we are also open to new partnerships that's going to include secular and maybe liberal organizations around the United States. So uh, I'm very, very excited to announce it. Um, if you are a student who is watching this, please contact us. And if you are a donor who is interested in giving money to this project, please contact us as well. My email is faisalmutar91 at gmail.com or you can contact my agent. So the please uh so the, so we're gonna if we have suggested speakers that you want to bring to campus, please email us as well. So we are very fresh. We have our training uh, in July. Uh we're gonna design a curriculum. Uh, to make sure like our speakers are legit and well fed and mm -hmm. are gonna have a good time. We're gonna have great events. So I'm very excited and uh, I'll, I'll be soon there it's gonna in, be uh, in uh, San Francisco. I think it's San Francisco for the yes. training. So yeah, uh, I'll be there too. For those who are interested, go to if you just Google Ayan Hirsi Ali Foundation Ideas Beyond Borders, you will see the press release about the whole campus program. And how can how can you be get involved? And if you are a student or a speaker, so here is my announcement, and and, and it's also another. Yeah, so I hope that my organization is gonna be our first project, and we're gonna be making change in a very short time. Inshallah. I mean, inshallah. inshallah. Out, out. We're out yeah, now. Know, that's a, it's a, it's yeah. It's it's we're really exciting. It's, it's really exciting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cool. So on that note. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. This was a lot of fun. Um, despite Lalo, uh, <laughs> yeah, know, was trying to create trouble, sect sectarian <laughs> violence between like the Arabs and the Pakistanis and the right. Shias it's all Lalo's fault. Sunnis. That stuff uh, never we existed. We love you, Lalo. <laughs> we, Lalo knows. Anyway, so um, a shit disturber. Yeah, so so uh, yeah. Thank you guys for the questions. We, this was a lot of fun. We'll do this again. Yeah, I love this. I, we should actually do this Q&A yeah. more. Like, I like I like to see what the audience wants, what our patrons mm -hmm. want uh, mm -hmm. in their head. And it's also very easy to stimulate dialogue. Other than By the like, way, yeah. if you're listening to this Talk on the about podcast, hair. if you're listening to this on the podcast, the way to join the Q&A is to become a patron. Even if it's just like $1 you get to be join our Q and A. No, $1 no, is nothing. We still but, let you but, in but, at $1. Uh, Some people are poor uh, students. Actually, I... I was yes. very, I want to make a very nice announcement. You probably have seen it. Thank you so much for the people who have put reviews yes. in our podcast. Even if you don't have I, money. I saw the reviews on iTunes. They were yes. great. Please, if if you know your friends, listen to the podcast as well. Please encourage them to leave a 
review. It's actually very encouraging for us to hear that our voice is being heard and we're making an impact. Mm -hmm. Please keep doing yeah. it. Uh, we're on iTunes and Saudi Clouds and some other apps. Facebook, I guess, so. Facebook also accepts reviews so on Facebook. So if you're broke and you can't they give us any money, leave us a review. Yeah, and, and like keep out, keep out the love. Please send us love mail. Uh, sh show us that we are impacting your no life. No more dick pics, though. So we know that love we're... mail, but no dick pics. Yeah, no dick pics. <laughs> uh, you can send me the dick pics. So I can send <laughs> I'll it to ISIS. Them to you. So I can send it to ISIS. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> yes, so I have, I have some cousins in Garaka who can take care of you if you send a dick pic. So that's a joke, by the way, I don't have anyone in ISIS, but anyway, so please like send us, send us your reviews, send us your, your, uh, love and send us your money. <laughs> so <laughs> my last, last thing I, when I went to, when we went to imagine the, the imagine conference, I can't tell you how many, I was amazed at how many people came up to me and told me that they loved the podcast. Armin, you probably saw that too. Oh my Loads God. Yeah. Of people just came up. They're like, I love the podcast. Love the podcast. It was, uh, so, so that we know that there are a lot of people out there listening. So tell Yay, your friends about this it. This was a great idea for starting this, Armin. Well done. Apparently something, so yeah, Armin started this. Like, the, the, it's my, the, it's apparently my idea. there's something we're Don't doing the that's right. The the it was the Persians' idea. idea. <laughs> they started yeah, civilization. Uh, but yeah, I mean, please, actually, I have heard that those podcasts who get a lot of reviews make it to the front page of the iTunes app. Mm -hmm. So please, like, uh, leave us reviews and stuff. So maybe the more we get listeners, the more we get reviews, maybe people who might not even interested in these subjects will see our podcast and listen to it. Uh, so please spread the word. We want as many listeners as possible. We want as much money as possible. We want as much falafel as possible. And thank you very much. And may God bless you. May God bless the United States of America. Good night, God everybody. Bless everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye, bye. The Secular Jihadists have been made possible thanks to the gracious support of the Illuminati and the great state of Israel. That's what we have been told, but we haven't received our checks yet. In the meantime, we greatly appreciate the support of our current donors. Please consider supporting by sharing the podcast with your fellow heathens or by donating at patreon.com slash sjme.